So hello, everyone, um, and thank you for that kind introduction. My name is Bear, and I lead the developer relations team at Slack. Uh, developer relations is at Slack, a team that sits inside our platform product team. So we are a group of engineers that build tooling and API documentation and programs so that developers can build integrations with Slack. And we're a globally distributed team. Uh, we have people on the team from Dublin uh, through all time zones in the US and all the way to Tokyo. Um, so we have a large geographic spread and also a time zone spread and people in many, many offices. So when we had to make the transition to all remote work, it was a little bit easier for us because we were already working in a distributed fashion and we already had some team practices in place that made the transition not so difficult when we weren't all in the same room because we were used to not being all in the same room. So I'll talk a little bit today about how my team made the shift, but today I'm not here just to talk about my team. I'm also here to share insights that we've learned about teams around the world and how they've managed this drastic shift to working remote and also how they plan to manage it in the future. So some of the research I'm going to be sharing today is from the Future Forum, which is a consortium backed by Slack that's dedicated to helping companies thrive in a digital first world. So the Future Forum is focused on combining research-driven insights, like everything I'm going to be sharing today, and also executive events. So conversations in small groups that allow executives to compare practices at their different companies and work through solutions together. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the Future Forum came to be. Um, in less than a week in mid-March, when many of the companies around the world were, were shutting down and going remote, companies had to make bigger changes than they thought were possible all at once. Um, and in order to be able to make the shift to remote, these changes were in July. Um, it was people who identify as skilled office workers in the US, the UK, France, Germany, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and we found that there were some key themes about what was beneficial about the change and what had been challenging. So the top benefits that we all see are you know, commuting. I personally love having an hour back every day where I'm not on the bus or walking. Um, some saved money, uh, again, on commuting, that car costs, gas, all of that is, is no longer something that people have to consider. And also improved work-life balance was something a lot of people cited as improving after this shift to remote. On the other hand, the challenges that people had top among everyone were unstable Wi-Fi. If you don't have the type of robust connection at home as you have in the office, that makes everything more difficult in terms of getting work done, connecting with your colleagues and so on. Other top challenge was maintaining relationships. It can be hard when we're all looking at a screen all day to make the same kinds of small social investments that keep relationships moving and keep the, that investment going. Um, not seeing people by chance in the hallway or, or around the office also means that you sometimes lose touch with people who you aren't intentionally working to get in touch with. And then the last thing that knowledge workers shared was a challenge was staying focused. Uh, so balancing the work that you have with challenges at home, like caring for kids or other family, thinking about your own health and so on. So even then this change opened people's eyes to a new potential for what work could look like. Only 12% of the knowledge workers we surveyed want to return to working full-time in the office. And only 16% want to stay completely remote. So most people want something in the middle. They want flexibility. People want to work in a hybrid environment where we can work from home more often, but we have a moment to use physical space together when we need it. And people's expectations have changed too. Uh, out of what they, they need from an office, out of what they want from time spent with their coworkers. So for leading companies, this is a big opportunity. Uh, the opportunity is to move to distributed teams, which enables you to tap broader talent pools and not risk losing the talented people who want this something in between situation. Um, you want to be able to provide that to them. 
So companies are using this as a moment to rethink the role of the office and where and how you give people access to shared space. So there are a variety of different models that you can use from either completely virtual to everyone is back in the office all the time. And we see some examples of companies that, that are doing some sort of hybrid already. Even virtual companies like GitLab and Automatic, where they say they're 100% they're remote, they do depend on occasional times together where everyone is gathered in the same physical space so they can build team and rebuild interpersonal relationships and get some amount of face time. And companies like Dropbox uh, are moving to what they call virtual first, uh, but the idea is that they also have physical spaces called studios that are for teams that need space. So a lot of companies are already operating in this hybrid environment, finding ways to allow some people who need offices to have that, while also allowing more flexibility to work from anywhere more often. And this move to hybrid work opens up huge opportunities to rethink where you hire and who you hire. So companies have wider talent pools to tap geographically and also in terms of more diverse groups. And talented individuals with options are going to go to the companies that allow them the flexibility that they want. So where people work is one part of this hybrid future, but we wanted to more deeply understand what is working and what isn't working for people who are remote. So we conducted our remote employee experience index, which was asking about 5,000 people working remotely to compare their experience scored on a scale from much better to much worse remote versus in the office. And the midpoint was meant to be just about the same as if we're in the office. And so the first round of this index showed that work-life balance was better for most people working remote. And there's a big asterisk here for working mothers in particular. Uh, work stress levels were better working remote. And our study, like others, shows that productivity is actually up for more people rather than down. Um, but belonging, this sense of belonging area in the red, that's where people are struggling. It's a sense of isolation, how to be part of a team. But overall, people's satisfaction with working remotely is better than it is in the office. Um, and what we found is that people who did what we called before the lift and shift, which is to say they're acting just as they did in the office, but they're doing it all over video conference. Those companies did worse than the companies that had invested in digital tools and had actually meaningfully changed the way that they work. So here, here are two examples. Uh, video call to video call, you actually have a plan for your day and also getting exercise. But from a team perspective, and this is what companies and managers should pay most attention to, is investments in team cohesion that build belonging are still incredibly important to team success and maintaining team chemistry. So the, the remote employee index showed that organizations need to create opportunities for social interactions less frequently, but more explicitly. So a weekly status update meeting is too frequent and it's not, it's not a celebration, it's a positive moment. You need to actually think about the types of event and meeting that are going to build that sense of bonding. So for example, that might look like every two weeks, having a team celebration to recognize team members' achievements that raised people's experience by about 10 points, monthly team building activities or games and unstructured group social activities. So one of the things that I've done on my own team is have some of our standing meetings where we're just talking and hanging out. And in a room of about 20 people, you, you can't get everyone speaking. Even in a group size as small as six, uh, it's usually two people out of six who do 60% of the talking. So we try and use tools like Zoom rooms to break people into smaller groups where they can have that social bonding. And it doesn't even need to have an agenda, but just having that FaceTime in a size where people have the opportunity to speak can be really helpful. Another thing that we did was we created a version of Team Jeopardy where uh, one person on the team got trivia facts about people on our team and organized it into a group board. And when we played Jeopardy, every time an answer was revealed that 
that team member had a moment to tell the story of their trivia fact. And it was a lot of fun. It didn't take tons of time to organize. And it was a really fantastic structured bonding opportunity that got people in, in the space where they felt like they could celebrate. It wasn't that we had a status meeting. And so that becomes team bonding. It is specifically a activity that is structured to bring people together. So moving from digital transformation, uh, moving into digital transformation means making this bigger shift in how we behave than just turning meetings into video conferences. We have to be intentional about a few pieces in the system, uh, specifically people process and place, which will give us an opportunity to think about how we build better teams. So let's start with the people piece and what needs to change specifically in terms of leadership and management. Attracting talent is only the first step. Trying to build a productive, agile team takes a different approach to leadership. And one thing that we found that was quite interesting is that managers are having a really hard time with outdated management techniques that don't apply to the type of work that we're doing now. Complex, interdisciplinary work, um, let alone trying to do something like build purpose in a workforce that's looking for meaning in their work right now. So it really has to start from purpose. And that's because people who are very talented aren't looking to come into work to punch a clock. And particularly in tumultuous times around the world, having some feeling of meaning in the work that you're doing every day helps people be more satisfied at work and also continuing to get things done. In our global survey of executives, 89% felt that a strong sense of collective purposes influences employee satisfaction. It also in, uh, influences the organization's ability to transform and even increase customer loyalty. So creating that sense of purpose can be quite difficult and managers are really struggling both with that task and also with their general satisfaction at work. Um, they're struggling more than individual contributors on their overall sense of well-being, their sense of belonging, certainly, their productivity and their work arrangements. And middle managers in particular are hard hit because they're caught. They don't necessarily have a network of people that they can go to. So some of their biggest concerns are things that would say time spent tracking other people's workloads and ensuring that they know what needs to be done. So what most managers do in this situation is call status meetings to try and figure out what people are up to. Um, and so what we need to do is help managers shift from this understanding of goals being based on activities and moving that into goals that are based on output. So what does that mean? So in thinking about outcomes over output, it means that we have to think less about focusing on attendance, whether or not somebody's in the meeting, whether or not they're responding to you at a particular point in time with a flexible schedule they might. So manager training needs to focus on three core skills. The first is creating clarity, which starts with purpose. So leaders need to synthesize and share information, create context that allows agile teams to move quickly and make sure that people have the, the knowledge that they need and the context to be able to do their jobs. The second thing they need to do is inspired trust. And that is something that you get by investing in people, in their well-being, in their career development, making sure that people have psychological safety at work and the ability to do things like question assumptions and share ideas without being worried about repercussions. So trust is built on transparency and you, you build trust over time by communicating openly, sharing information rather than hoarding it. And the last piece that they do is unlock potential. So challenging and supporting teams with diverse perspectives, amplifying different voices in conversation and avoiding groupthink. Success hinges on involving everyone and a diverse workforce requires true inclusion, equity and belonging. So this is all very straightforward to talk about, 
as a set of principles, but putting them into practice is the most important thing. And at Slack, we actually have a required management training course that we call Basecamp. You can see that all of these are, are mountains in these images, where all the managers have to reflect on how they're doing across these various goals and try to make personal roadmaps for how they're going to do better in these various categories. Equity um, is about aligning the things that you do with the things that you say. It's all very well to say, we care a lot about investing in people, but then if people see that no one is ever getting promoted, people feel like they're working on the same projects over and over again, everyone notices that difference between what you say and what you do. So making sure that your actions actually are consistent with what you say and also what the team values is incredibly important for inspiring that trust. Investing in people is important for inspiring trust as well being sincerely interested in the team member's success and well-being. Um, and then the last piece is cultivating competence, making sure that people who have the skills and the abilities to do their jobs well are matched with the work that really enables them to use those skills and even grow those skills as well. And then the last piece that we have a checklist for is unlocking performance. So thinking about how you can intentionally assign work, considering people's strengths and motivations. Um, driving continuous improvement by asking people to really reflect and think through how we could do better. How can we do better the next time? And also creating accountability for results. And something that I want to call out here is that accountability doesn't just mean potential punishment if you don't, if you don't achieve your goal. It's about celebrating achievements. And it's also about not allowing low performance to persist on a team where people are taking on undue burdens because other people on the team are, are dropping balls and leaving them to pick up that work. So these more concrete principles are something that's really helpful for managers to think through, where is my team doing well? Where am I doing good things for my team? And where do we need to, to double down so that we can deliver this better experience that works well in a remote world. So that's the shift that we need to make in our management techniques. But in the research from the Future Forum, we also found major opportunities to rethink work process. So in the office, we have for a long time had a norm that work happens between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And most companies generally choose to follow that logic into the remote world. If you put a meeting on someone's calendar at 9 a.m., it's generally expected that they will be there. And we've known for years that meetings are not always productive uses of time. Uh, in 2017, a professor named Leslie Parlow at Harvard Business School surveyed 182 senior managers, and 71% of them said meetings are unproductive and inefficient. 65% of them said meetings keep them from completing their own work. And 64% said meetings come at the expense of doing deep thinking. 62%, still a majority, said meetings miss opportunities to bring the team closer together. So we know that meetings are not always great and that they have some problems. And these challenges have gotten worse in the pandemic. People are wrestling with enormous burdens in addition to what's going on at work. And so we need to change our, our process around meetings. The index, the remote employee index, showed that one of the biggest factors that influences a positive remote experience is the ability to break free of the nine to five and instead work a flexible schedule. So workers who have the option of working a flexible schedule score higher than those who are forced to continue to work nine to five across every element of the index. And the positive impact on elements like work-life balance, which was 23 points up, shouldn't surprise anyone. But what is more interesting is the fact that people with flexible schedules score nearly twice as high on productivity compared to people who are working nine to five and significantly better when it comes to sense of belonging and only slight negative impact minus 0.2 instead of minus 5.8 on sense of belonging. So we need to change this interaction model. And there are some things that we can do to better enable flexibility without harming the team's ability to work together. The first thing is creating dedicated team hours and changing that dedicated team hour from being a smaller window than eight hours. 
So by creating blocks of time for team collaboration specifically, uh, you can call them burst blocks where you expect everyone on the team to be available to work together. So for teams like mine that are distributed globally, you might want to consider what time zones people are in and maybe create one burst if your team is all in the same time zone, actually drive better idea generation. And a way to make that work, the only way to make that work is to start taking more meetings off your calendar. And there are smart ways to do this. Start by looking at every meeting that you have that has more than eight people in it, where the objective isn't clearly decision-making or team bonding, and try to move everything as possible from synchronous meetings to tools. So for example, is it a status check? Move it to a tool like a Slack channel or a spreadsheet or a living document and give people deadlines for when they need to put updates in there and rules for how you talk about, for example, an item that's not on track. Second, is it a broad communication meeting? You can record it and then share your recording and your slides and any write-ups, giving people the opportunity to ask questions in public channel. And both of these things make it a lot easier to be transparent. When something happens in a meeting, the people in the room know what happened. When something happens in, for example, a public Slack channel, anyone can see the output. And if it affects the work that they need to do, it means that they have access to that information now in a way that they didn't if all of the decisions and all of the conversation are happening in meetings. And most importantly, it means that you get to have fewer meetings. So that is talking about some of the processes that need to change. And then there's the bit about place, digital space and physical locations where work happens that need to be redesigned for this hybrid flexible model. So in the traditional corporate setup, including at Slack before the pandemic hit, uh, we had one central headquarters and that headquarters had an executive floor and then floors where different teams huddled together. And if you weren't at headquarters, for example, if you were in a uh, remote office, a remote office, you didn't, you lost that connection, that regular connection with headquarters. And in some places that definitely felt like there was a ceiling for people's careers. If you were in the remote office that is in a time zone three hours away, the top you might be able to go is say director or head of a country and so on. And there were whole teams that felt left out or were looking locally for career advancement opportunities, but were limited by the physical space of needing to gather. So now we have this opportunity to unpack the office and the next generation of leaders are going to move to a digital headquarters, but still leverage physical office spaces for people who need it. And for the varieties of needs the companies have always had outside the 80% of the space that people use just to do heads down work. So many companies have functions that require office access for some portion of their work. So it might be things like a production studio for a video company, or really high bandwidth computation, or a lab for, for a company like Pfizer or AstraZeneca, they need to be in the lab. Um, but workers who don't need that physical space have voiced their desire for flexibility. 88% of them want that flexibility. So if you don't give that, that flexibility to them, you're going to end up losing your best talent. So the lifeblood of your company which is people's communication, the knowledge that they have, the information. For most companies, that was already digital. Um, the average enterprise is already using over a thousand different SaaS tools to do things like uh, track sales pipelines through your CRM system, to do things like share project management updates, to manage your social presence online. So many of these different things happen across thousands of SaaS tools. So all of that information is already online. It's in the cloud. And the tools people use are incredibly important to making individuals and functions more important. But context switching is still a big drag on productivity. So switching between the apps and where you interact with them takes away some of the efficiency gain you get. So uh, more than 64% of workers in our 2019 state of work survey said they spend more than 30 minutes a day just switching 
between tools. That's 130 hours a year just on switching between tools. So information exists in the cloud, but it's in a lot of different places and you need a place to bring them all together. And even in the world in which we are sitting in the office, having a physical office doesn't help. You need some place online where all of that comes together. And so this concept of a digital headquarters becomes critical. It's where you do things like ask questions that, that people might have uh, to. So we are doing more and more to share our research from the Future Forum out through the Future Forum website at futureforum.com. So there's a lot of collected research there, everything from how to manage remotely more effectively to how you can create this digital headquarters for your team. And we try and focus on the concrete tips that will help you actually make these differences. It's very easy to say workers want to be flexible, but doing the making the organizational change so that people actually get that flexibility is where the, the promise that you make really has to turn into reality. So our focus for the next several months and years is going to be on sharing those concrete tips and you can find them all through the Future Forum. That said, I did want to leave some time for questions as well. So thank you so much for having me. And I am happy to answer any questions that you might have, either about how my team is operating throughout these changes or uh, some of the research that's coming forward with the Future Forum. Thank you.